The devil is a professional loser. You are anointed to win. Welcome to the Whoop the Devil podcast. Here's your host, Corey Scarlett. I have one more video. So this video was actually the video I was going to show at uh, church last night because I was talking about it's Father's Day and I was talking about how there's been an attack on masculinity. And uh, with that, um, there has been, uh, you know, it's evident in society. So uh, our military, and I was talking about how we got to stand in our country as strong men, but our military a couple years ago uh, put out this ad as a recruitment video, okay? So it was pretty uh, ridiculous. So I'm going to play it for you. And then it has a Russian recruitment ad afterwards. And I wasn't going to play this one in church, but I'll play it on the podcast. How about that? So just to show the, the comparison, uh, it's a re- Russian recruitment ad after the American one. And this this one was put out, I believe, in twenty, either 2020 or 2021. It said three years ago, so I'm assuming 2021. And uh, here it is. Hold your horses and be ready for what you're about to witness. This was legitimate. This is not, uh, I feel like I've hit trailer hitches like that growing up a lot. <laughs> I'll tell you what I used to run into a lot was the side view mirrors. And my daughter hit one the other day and I felt um, it triggered a memory, a core memory of me running into a side view mirror. Speaking of core memories, I'd like to give the movie Inside Out 2. I saw it today with Sayla. And usually when I watch kids movies with her, I zone out. But I watched the whole movie. That was a great movie. I will give it on a scale of one to ten. On and we're talking kids movies. I'm gonna give it like a solid nine, nine point five. That was a great kids movie. It was that good. Okay. Um, so I watched it. It was good. And uh, yeah. And and I there was a little bit of concern that we had because um, the anxiety was one of the emotions and I didn't know how they were going to take that, but, um, it, it's good how they do it. Anxiety is never, uh, an emotion that's looked at in a positive light. Okay. And it's very, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a great film. Good stuff. Guys, you want to go watch it, go watch it. Uh, parents review 10 out of 10 would recommend. I would, well, nine, 9.5, nine, 9.5. All right. Anyway, so military recruitment video from, um, the United States military, and then a Russian one. And these came out or in the same year, I believe, 2021. So check it out. This is real, not fake. Not fake news. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. Although I had a fairly typical childhood, took ballet, played violin, I also marched for equality. I like to think I've been defending freedom from an early age. When I was six years old, One of my moms had an accident that left her paralyzed. Doctors said she might never walk again, but she tapped into my family's pride to get back on her feet, eventually standing at the altar to marry my other mom. With such powerful role models, I finished high school at the top of my class and then attended UC Davis, where I joined a sorority full of other strong women. But as graduation approached, I began feeling like I'd been handed so much in life, a sorority girl stereotype. Sure, I'd spent my life around inspiring women, but what had I really achieved on my own? One of my sorority sisters was studying abroad in Italy. Another was climbing Mount Everest. I needed my own adventures, my own challenge. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it. A way to prove my inner strength and maybe shatter some stereotypes along the way. I'm 
U.S. Army Corporal Emma Malone Lord, and I answered my calling. All right. I'm all for women in the military if they want to, if they're willing to go through all that, okay? But what do that got to do with, what? how does any of that story have anything to do with joining the military? And and the they just push so many different, like, agendas in one uh, recruitment video. So that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Now you're going to see a Russian recruitment video. And it should wake you up to know that if we don't get our stuff together in this country, they're going to try to pull us down into this feminized um, garbage where they're basically um, demasculinizing every man and feminizing men and trying to uh, just go completely against any, any semblance of... Yeah, a very confusing military ad. Go against any semblance of gender roles that a male or a female would be different. And um, we are different, okay? And it's more than biologically. So uh, what does this have to do with the military? How does this want to... Why would this... This would speak to a certain sect of society. Most of them have blue hair and work at... Um, Starbucks. I'm not being judgmental or stereotypical, but uh, that's part of society. That's who they want. And really, um, ah, man, I could, I don't want to go all there right now, but that's crazy that that would be what you would think would be a military recruitment ad that would encourage somebody to join. I think I want to join because I saw the pride my two moms had and I tapped into it. Oh my gosh. Seriously? Okay. I mean, maybe if maybe they're trying to meet a certain quota of females in the military. That may speak to a few females. Uh, most females are going to look at that and say, that's weird. But let's see the Russian recruitment ad that came around the same time. Now, they put an English voiceover on it. So, check it out. It's... This is the first day of your new life. What was yesterday means nothing now. Who you were before, no one cares now. What's important now is who you'll be today. What do you know about yourself? What are you capable of? Questions may remain unanswered, but can you sleep soundly later on? Knowing yourself, knowing the limit of your possibilities, to hell with limits. Are you ready to break yourself? Every day, pain hardens you here. It was you who decided to prove something to yourself. The commander is here only for you to see an enemy in him because without the enemy, there is no battle. Because without battle, there is no victory. But in reality, the main enemy is you, the you of yesterday. Your task is to track the enemy down, catch up to him, outperform him, become better than him, and return the victor. Because tomorrow is the first day of your new life. Wow. Right? That was crazy. So, um, make me not want to join. Uh, which one are you talking about, Monica? The, uh, okay. So, that Russian one was like, that. that's that's what the military is about. I mean, that's what you're really getting into in the military. You're not getting into uh, pride and whatever the heck was happening there. I don't even know. But, um, yeah, so uh, my point was showing that was that there's an attack on masculinity. And uh, there's this attempt to... What just happened? Who is playing... Sp Spotify is playing on my computer. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Let me turn this thing off. Okay. Cut that mess. <laughs> Slight interruption, guys. Okay. So, um, I'm all about women's rights and equality in that sense, but um, when it, there's a role that God has placed men to do, and there's a call for men to be men again, and I talked about this last night at church. I'm going to do a little recap um, if you guys want to go with me, I'm going to start in Joshua chapter 24. Um, I'm not going to give the long intro cause I, I don't have time to do that, but 
uh, I'm going to give you the qualities, 10 qualities um, of, let me find, I got this other computer, 10 qualities of real leaders. I'm going to go through those really quick. But I want to talk about this war on masculinity. And, and there's, there's a scripture in the Bible that actually says, act like men. And it's 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and act like men, and be strong. And what does that mean? What does it mean to act like a man? And that was the literal translation from the Bible. Um, yeah, they'll be checking you out in uniform. <laughs> You're funny. Um, so there's a way to act. That's a manly way to act. And, and I look at scripture and I look at what God has called the man to do in the household. And really what he's called every believer to do. Even, you know, I know there's a lot of ladies watching. And that's lead. Lead. And, you know, if you're a single woman, then, you know, you're leading. Your, and maybe you're a single mother. You're leading your family. But, uh, you know, if you're a father and you're not in the leadership role you're missing out on what God has called you to do. If the woman's making all the major decisions and you're just, you know, I'm talking with parenting, I'm talking with um, decision making in your household, uh, career choices and things like that, and you're just kind of following her around doing whatever makes her happy and you have no input, you have no say, you just going with the flow. You know, you have to be intentional as a man, as a leader to establish some things and especially cast vision and um, protect your family, fight for your family. I'm going to get into all these things today. But um, there's a war on masculinity. There's a war on femininity. There's a war on children. There's a war on um, the family unit. All these things are uh, things the devil is really trying to attack. So what we have, um, and I'm not like the manliest man in the world, but um, you know, I, I don't know how to kill an animal. Um, like with guns and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to hunt. Okay. Uh, I barely know how to fish and I really don't know how to fish. I just caught like a, a fish in a pond. Uh, and yet, you know, it wasn't like real fishing or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't know how to do all that, but I know what God said about being a man. It's more than just being like a, a, you know, talking down to people, walking around arrogant. That's not what, and that's what people talk about, toxic masculinity, and they blame all that on there. No, the the true masculinity that the Bible talks about is a leader, someone who walks and carries an authority. And um, I know I got a lot of women on here, so I want to speak to y'all too. If you, if, you know, you take leadership roles in your family, but you submit underneath your husband. And there's oftentimes what's happened is husbands, and fathers haven't stepped up spiritually, haven't stepped up in vision setting, vision casting. I'm talking about where we're going in the future as a family and having a plan to get there. Uh, haven't s stepped up in disciplining the children and setting the house in order and all those things like that. And so the woman has has been pushed into that role, whether they wanted to or not, um, and because they, they that it needs done. It needs somebody needs to, to handle that. So. Um, and I preached on that last night. I'm not going to get too much into it. If you guys want to get it into detail, I broke down the masculinity thing real heavy. Uh, in if you go to Dominion Sumter's uh, Facebook page, you can, or even the podcast, you can listen. That'll be up soon. You can listen to the audio or watch the video of my sermon on that. Now, I had a guy tell me, and I don't want to toot my own horn, but he said it was the best Father's Day message he's, he's heard since he's been in church, and he was a little bit older. So... It's a good message. So I'm going to get into some parts from that, but a little bit more detail. And um, the first thing I want to look at is Joshua 24. And Joshua is a prime example of great leadership in the Bible. Um, Joshua 24, 14. This is Joshua's last words, basically. That chapter is his last words as before he passes on. He's a leader of Israel um, after uh, Moses. He took Israel. So... Um, and he was a great leader, won a lot of battles, and they got into the promised land under Joshua's leadership, okay? So he tells them this. He gathers everybody together to give his final words. He reminds them of God's faithfulness over the years. There's a whole portion of that. And then you get into uh, verse 15, and he gives this 
call as a leader and he makes this clear declaration that every true leader and true especially fathers and if you're if you're a single mother in here or you're just an individual maybe you're single uh, and and you don't have any kids you've got to make this decision and you don't need to make it just when you have a family and just when you have kids you make it for yourself maybe you're on here you're a young person you're a single person you're a teenager i don't know who you are that's watching this but you've got to make this clear statement which he says i'll just skip ahead he says at the end of Joshua 24, 15, he says, uh, he said, this, uh, choose today who you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites who in whose land you live now? So they were in a land that uh, was pagan and there was other gods being worshiped and there was gods of the past that they worshiped. But he said this, as for me and my family, or as a lot of people know, the traditional translations that say, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Write that in the comments. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. If, you, if that's you, I want you to write that in the comments. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. And you have to make that decision as a, as a leader in your family, as a, as a, in, over your own single self, if you're single, make that decision. As for me and my family, everybody else can do whatever they want to do. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And that was Joshua taking the lead. And that's the biggest thing that, that I see happen. Um, you know, um, with this attack on men, they want them to be weak. They don't want them to be strong. They want them to be pushovers. They want them even the way that men are presented on TV and movies like goofballs, basically. Uh, and, 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 you know, the dad in the house is always the comedy character. And, you know, that makes for good TV sometimes. But, you know, strong men is something we need. We're not, we should not be a bunch of weak pushovers and idiots and losers. You know, um, I, I talked about this and I'll, I'll just go there real quick. Real men in the Bible, uh, if you look at the Bible and look at real men, uh, you have examples of Abraham, who was 85 years old, leading people into battle. He was not a wuss. You have Caleb, who was also 85 years old, who said, give me the mountain that you promised me, uh, that was promised to me, Joshua. Let me get that mountain. As Joshua was appointing the land, it's actually later on in that, or, um, a couple of chapters before what I just read you, when they got into the promised land, he was dividing it up. And Caleb, who was 85, said, yeah, I know I went in there and spied it out with you. And when we said we could take that land, um, but everybody, all, you know, when we were spies, we saw that and we believed we could take it. And I still believe I can take it, even at 85. And I know there's still giants in the land. And I don't care because if the Lord's with me, we'll, I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to take it. There were fighters at 85. You had young David, who was a, a, a great warrior, who talked smack back to Goliath, hit him with that rock, chopped the boy's head off, and ran around with his head for a little bit. He brought the head back. He was, and look, there's some violent language in that. You know, if you saw the earlier broadcast, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But, um, so... You know, you got that going on. You got Elijah, the prophet. He or he killed 80, 850 false prophets in one day, then outran the chariot. Uh, I mean, these were strong men in the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, light me on fire. Daniel, throw me in the lion's den. These were strong leaders in the Bible. Then you have Jesus, the strongest of them all, preaching to thousands with no microphone. He braided a whip to go <laughs> into the temple and run everybody out and flip tables over. I mean, they crowded him at the edge of a cliff and they were going to push him off and kill him. And he just walked through it with no fear and no problem. It said the translation, uh, most translations say he passed through the crowd. He was not scared. He preached with such authority and spoke with such authority that people were like, I've never heard anybody speak like this. And then not to mention the beating he took on the cross for us. He was a manly man. He was a strong man. He was not a wuss floating around saying, blessed are the peace, the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. Like Jack Sparrow reading poetry. No, 
<laughs> That's not who Jesus was. He was a strong man. He was not some soft-spoken wuss. And he got whooped on the cross, beaten, whipped, bloody, unrecognizable, and he never gave up. He carried that cross. He did it for you. And then he rose again. He's alive forevermore. And when we see him, his eyes are going to be like fire, his hair white as wool. He'll, a sword, two-edged sword, will proceed from his mouth. With the breath of his the breath of his mouth and the splendor of his coming, he will destroy the enemy. And he will rule and reign. And yesterday I said this, I said, uh, when I was preaching, I said that was, a t and somebody quoted it. Uh, that was the type of stuff, or that's the type of stuff that would make Thor pee in his pants. But anyways, let's keep going. So, um, I encourage you to watch the, the, uh, full broadcast. If you want to, I go into a lot about fathers and men. I'm going to keep this a little more general. It's not just about fathers, but it's about strong leaders in the family. Okay. Uh, and, and, and um, so 10 qualities of strong leadership real quick are real leaders, write this in the comments, 10 qualities of, re of a real leader, 10 qualities of a real leader. Number one quality, real leaders find strength in God and rise. They draw strength from God to lead with wisdom and peace. There's a story in the Bible. It's in first Samuel chapter 30. It's where David was leading his men, and he came back, and the Amalekites had raided their home in Ziklag, and they they crushed the city, burned it to the ground, carried off the women and children, and everyone else, but they didn't kill anybody. And this is just side note: Satan does not like families breaking up the family, right? This is an enemy of Israel, a type of the enemy now, Satan. So David saw all that. He, they said him and his men cried till they couldn't no more. They lost everything. And they, uh, he lost his wives. He lost his children. Uh, and now he was in great danger because they were going to stone David. He won't kill him because he let this happen under his leadership. And uh, so it says this in verse 6, 1 Samuel 36. But David found strength in the Lord his God. One translation says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. God's not a God who weakens men. God, Christianity is not a crutch that makes you weak. And if you raise your hands in church, men, and if you raise, you know, especially if you get involved uh, with the praise and worship and prayer and involved in the church, that uh, it makes you weaker. No. God gives strength to men. David was in the the worst time of his entire life right here. And uh, he found strength in the Lord to rise up and lead. God will give you the strength. And it's for every leader out there, not just talking to men. Not to freak out and panic when everything crumbles. Listen, you can find strength in God not to go into anxiety attack. And I've got inside out too on my brain, Okay. He'll give you peace of mind that passes all understanding. He'll give you the wisdom and the peace to lead your family. He'll give you real strength to confront an issue and not to avoid it. Many people avoid issues. When, the, when things crumble, they just try to find an escape. Some people turn to alcohol. Some people turn to drugs. Some people turn to, to uh, relationships they shouldn't be in. Some people just completely ignore it, avoid it altogether. Do something else. Try to run away from it. Move, leave town uh, when things mess up. And, but here's the thing. God will give you the strength to confront it and deal with it. That's the type of God we serve. So here's what happens. Um, David asked the Lord, should I chase the, the band of raiders and will I catch them? And the Lord said, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Uh, I love how Jonathan Shuttlesworth says this. He says, pursue, overtake, and recover all. And that's the anointing that God will give to you. To pursue, to go after whatever has been taken from you in life. To overtake the enemy and recover everything the enemy has been stolen. To go after it. And, and just make this commitment. Maybe in the past, you're reaping the consequences of things that you've done in the past. And you didn't know any better. But right now, you know better. Because I'm telling you, 
the better it is to go to God, to go to God and find what he, find strength in him so you can rise up and lead your family. You can lead your family. I'm telling you, young mother, young father, uh, old father, I don't know whoever you are <laughs> that's watching me right now. I'm telling you, you can find strength in the Lord. Maybe you're the, you're the leader of your household as a, as a woman. And I know I was talking to men when I, when I originally wrote this. You can find strength in the Lord. The whole thing can like is crumbling around you. But there's a way to encourage yourself in the Lord. And when things are crumbling, don't let God be your plan B, your plan C, all the way down to uh, X, Y, Z. And then maybe if, if I can't figure it out on my own, then I'll consult God. No, he needs to be plan A. When things start falling apart and on every decision that you make, that's that's uh, especially those important decisions, you have to go to God. You have to go to God. So number one, a real leader, want this quality, 10 qualities of real leaders. A real leader finds strength in God and rises to the occasion. Now, number two, and you can write this in the comments, real leaders fight for their family. Real leaders fight for their family. You got to actively guard against negative influences and raise children in a godly environment. You're not pursuing Amalekite ra raiders, but you are protecting your kids against this agenda from hell that's being pushed through the media, being pushed through the music, being pushed through bad friends, bad relationships, being pushed through uh, social media, being pushed through TV, whatever. It's being pushed, and you have to guard your kids against this because if you're not intentional and you let it just happen and you let them discover things for themselves and you don't, you don't give them God's way of doing it, they're going to be the type of kid that is, is, is on antidepressants, uh, over-medicated because they're stressed and anxious and in fear all the time. They're going to be the type of kid that's looking for an escape, uh, looking for uh, because the, the media pushes all this fear garbage and, and, and things that make people anxious and depressed. They're going to be looking for a blunt. They're going to be looking for pills. They're going to be looking for all of that. And, and listen, if you're not intentional, the government, the state, the school system, which there are great school teachers out there, but behind that in the public school system, there's an agenda that gets pushed and it's even creeps into private schools. And even I've heard Christian schools before. But if you let those people raise, you shouldn't even, you, you are raising your kids. The state is not responsible for raising your kids. You are. Because if you let them do it, they're going to teach them transgenderism. They're going to teach them uh, a bunch of sexual perverted garbage. They're going to teach them lawlessness. They're going to teach them to hate America. They're going to teach them to hate capitalism. They're going to teach them to have a victim mentality. They're going to teach them to love Marxism and communism. They're going to teach them to... Uh, um, identify as, you know, a two-spirit penguin. I don't know. They'll teach them you be whatever you want to be. Have it your way like it's Burger King over your life. No, you got to teach them the right way. I said this yesterday. I'll say it again. Uh, the state wants your kids all day. They want them from as early as possible all the way to the as late as possible. And you have to be intentional about protecting your family from uh, what the enemy wants to do. They'll say things like, it takes a village. It takes a village. And maybe you said that. Thank God for good people that you can have in your life and people that you can trust. But the government pushes, it takes, it takes a village to tell you, hey, we want to get you early care. So if you go to work early, then we'll get you in school all day. Then we'll do after school care and we'll keep your kids all day in a government funded facility and teach them a bunch of garbage. Teach them, let them be who we want them, who, you know, turn them into who we want them to be. And, and that's why you got to be in, intentional. And it doesn't take a village. Thank God for good people like your church folk, your family that you can trust. But even you can have family that you don't trust. You can have people at church that you don't want uh, to be influencing your kids. You have to be intentional. It doesn't take a village. It takes a family led by God. It takes a mom and a dad on the same page that's going to be, a, that's going to be led by God and they're going to lead their children right and they're going to vet every villager that comes through the doors. You feel me? Understand, you've got to protect your family. 
In Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7, God was telling, um, who was this? Deuteronomy, probably Moses, right? Help me out, guys. I should know this. Uh, and you must commit yourself whole, wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today, to God's words, to God's word. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Here's the thing. You have to do that with your kids. You have to lead, You have to teach them the word of God. You have to teach them God's ways. Don't leave it all on the pastor. Don't leave it all on the church. Especially when, when, when most people that do that barely show up to church anyway. You have to do, this has to be your life. Christianity is not just a hobby. Church is not a hobby. It's a thing you do out of a love for God. And a thing you do to understand the importance of learning God's word and getting it into your family and getting it into your children. That's the thing here. So, because where you fail to lead and where you fail to be intentional and where you fail to protect, somebody else will come in and lead. Something else will come in and teach. Something else will enter, enter into their mind and change the way they think. That's why you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. So number two was real leaders fight for their family. Number three, real leaders set a righteous standard. Number three, real leaders set a righteous standard. You've got to uphold and model righteousness, creating a home that honors God. Psalm 5, 12 in the Amplified Classic, it says, for you, Lord, will bless the uncompromisingly righteous, him who is upright and in right standing with you, uncompromisingly, even when it's inconvenient. As with a shield, you will surround him with goodwill, pleasure, and favor. Right in the comments, his favor will follow my righteousness. His favor will follow my righteousness. Just like you can... People can role model bad behavior and people pick it up and they pick up patterns and cycles. And if you want to call it generational curses, whatever you want to call it, a generational cycle, it's learned behavior and, and sin when it's undealt with will definitely be carried on to the next generation. But you people can model that bad behavior, but you can also model righteousness to your children and you're supposed to Proverbs 27 the righteous man walks in integrity his children are blessed after him they're blessed after him it comes after you you model the in integrity you model righteousness you model love you model peace you model joy and your children are blessed your children are favored after you and yes your children are to obey and honor that's what they're supposed to do but give them something worth honoring. Make up your mind to have a standard of holiness. Make up your mind that you don't have affairs. If you're married, I don't have affairs. Make up your mind. If you're single and you have children and, and, and you're struggling, make up your mind. I, I may have made mistakes in the past, but I ain't making no, none no more because I need my children to see an example of righteousness. Make up your mind if you're married that divorce is never an option. We're not, you don't even use it as a threat. Me and my wife, we don't use that word in our house. We've never said that. We made that decision. We will never threaten divorce. We will never use that word. And, and you've got to, you know, especially uh, men, because, you know, most, I, I, didn't, I couldn't speak on this because we don't have a children's ministry uh, set up yet in Dominion Sumter. So I had a bunch of kids in there, but I'm going to speak on this part here because it's very important. You've got to have self-control when it comes to sexual things. You have to have it, especially as a man, because a lot of times women, you know, men are so sexually driven and there's a, you know, if you let that standard down, you know, maybe in a relationship, you guys are planning on getting married. You're not married yet, and you're trying to be a leader in the relationship. And you and but you leave that door open for sex. You're going to fall into sin. If that door's open, people are going to come in into that door. It is what it is. And and you've got to have self control in that area. And if the man especially has it and takes the lead, the woman will follow. I guarantee you. 
90% of the time it's that way. And yes, women throw themselves at men. There's some women like that, but that's because they think that's how they're going to attract them. Most of the time, they think that's the only way they can, they can keep them. Um, anyways, God didn't put this order of sex after marriage and no sex other than the woman that you married or the man that you married. He didn't put it in the Bible to take the fun out of life. He did it to keep the fun in life, to keep you from these problems. Think about how many problems have came in life because somebody did sex out of God's order. Think maybe you on here, you, 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 you're, you're watching and you say, man, yeah, I faced that problem. Thank God for his mercy and thank God for his grace. But if you think about how many problems you see, this couple can't stay together. Well, they, they shouldn't have been together in the first place. They did things out of God's order. And now they're struggling to stay together. Now they're struggling to, to figure uh, they, they, they won't commit to marriage or, or whatever's going on. They're, you know, the man doesn't really love the woman. He just, they got involved sexually. She fell in love. Now they got kids. And now, like Kanye West said, 18 years, 18 years, he got to pay that child support. Okay? Now, it, it gets out of order. And, and, and the father leaves. And, and there's... The fatherlessness the statistics are crazy. I'll read them real quick. Some I had written down. And it messes things up. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts. 70% of long-term prison inmates. 90% of all homeless and runaway youth. 85% of children with behavioral disorders. 71% of all pregnant teens. I don't have numbers on this, but kids that are transitioning, gender transitioning and all that stuff, you don't see fathers in the home. Drag queen story hour, you don't see fathers rooting on uh, <laughs> the drag queens in the libraries. Um, that stuff don't happen. What I'm telling you is you need to understand there's major problems that can come from doing things out of God's order, especially when it comes sexually. David and Bathsheba caused a lot of issues. A stillborn baby and uh, a bunch of mess in his family that happened later on. You know, Donald Trump, I guarantee you, he wishes he didn't get it. You know, maybe nothing happened with him and Stormy Daniels or whatever that case is. But he, he wishes he didn't even come within five to ten feet of that woman. And I, I'm telling you, just make up your mind. You're not going to go, hey, make up your mind. You're not going to go down that road. Make up your mind. You won't even be in places that lead to that. There's bars and clubs and, and certain places that lead to sex and sexual things. And, and you just don't go there. You don't go out as a married man and hang out at a bar. You don't. You don't go out as a Christian and do that, period. But... You've got to set a standard of righteousness. Let me let me keep going. Uh, um, and and just like a, a my, my last point with that, just like you can set a, a a bad example of alcoholism and impurity and lust and all this stuff, um, and pass that on to your children, you can pass on a legacy of righteousness. Now this next one's really good. Real leaders number four. Real leaders set their house in order. Number four, real leaders set their house in order. They address and correct issues in the home with, with discipline and godliness. If there's something you don't like in your household, you fix it. If there's something you don't like, you fix it as the leader of your house. It ain't going to fix itself. Uh, crap won't clean itself up. And I saw a man say this. If you stand around and crap so long, eventually it stops smelling to you. So you don't even realize it's there. You've avoided it so long. You, it's out of order. It's nasty. And you don't even smell it no more. But everybody else smells it. <laughs> it's like bad breath. You don't even know you got it, but everybody else does. Real leaders set their house in order. You know, Eli... In the Bible, Eli the priest would not correct his sons and it messed things up. He would not, they were out of order and he would not set it in order. You can read it. It's in 1 Samuel. 
the first couple of chapters, caused all kinds of issues. David and his wicked sons. People miss this. This is, I believe, in the end of 2 Samuel. <clears throat> you can read throughout about David's sons that were wild. He never disciplined his wicked sons, though. Check this out. Amnon was David's son who slept with his half-sister, excuse me, who raped his half-sister, Tamar. And David would not discipline him. The king would not discipline his son. So his other son, Absalom, killed Amnon for doing that to his sister. So his son killed his other son who raped his, his daughter. And then Absalom, this, this starts this whole rebellion in Absalom where he's like, I'm going to usurp my, my uh, dad's authority. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get political support from people and I'm going to declare myself king. So he does that. And David doesn't deal with him. He literally leaves town, leaves Jerusalem and tells his soldiers, if they come in contact, if you come in contact with Absalom, please deal with him gently, which did not happen. You can read that later. They dealt with him harshly because he was an evil man. And then later, another son, Adonijah, tries to usurp David's throne. And David does nothing about it. And uh, so guess who has to do something about it? His predecessor in the, in the kingship, Solomon, his other son, was the one that ended up having Adonijah killed. So the things you don't set in order and the things you don't deal with, guess who has to deal with it? As a parent, your children will have to deal with it. If you don't, as a father, fix your anger issues, your kids are going to have to deal with anger issues. If you, as a mother, don't fix that prescription pill problem you got going on, your kids are going to have to deal with that same giant. And if you need to kill it, preferably before they come into the world, if you're single on here, that's, that's the idea. You need to go to God and say, what can I work on? every day and get better, get holier, get um, uh, more righteous in your living, more sanctified, the process of sanctification that old Christians used to call it. But let me keep going. You got to set your house in order. You got to set your house in order because your kids will deal with what you don't deal with. And their problems that are in your house won't get better just by time. They have to be dealt with. You know, in Genesis 18, 19, God was talking to Abraham and said, uh, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and household after him to do righteousness and justice, uh, basically to keep the way of the Lord. And people don't do that. They don't command their, their children anymore. And I'm not talking about being mean and bossy uh, and being just nasty with it and being a verbally abusive and being just talking down to people, but I am talking about setting things in order. So uh, you've got a command. You you don't ask your child, hey, do you want to go to church today, little Billy? You know, this gentle parenting where you get on their level. No, that, that's, that's crazy. You don't do that. You command your household. You set it in order. And I'm not saying it in a disrespectful way, woman, well, go make me a sandwich. I'm not saying that kind of stuff, but I'm saying you set the order as a man if, if you're a mother, you can set the order of how your kids, don't have your kids boss you around. Don't have them boss you around. You don't need to be a pushover, nor do you need to be an abusive parent who just talks down and verbally eviscerates people. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Don't be a abusive talker and a provoker. Rather, bring them up, not bring them down, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Discipline is biblical. People say, spare the rod and spoil the child. They love that verse, but it's not actually a verse. It's actually uh, something that like Ben Franklin wrote in an almanac, okay? <laughs> the Bible says it rougher, to be honest. I'm gonna read you a couple of scriptures about discipline. Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. The rod of discipline. There's a physical discipline that God, God gives you permission to do that. To pop, to spank, to break out the wooden spatula. Whatever you need to do. Those who spare the rod of discipline 
to have your child go pick a switch out the yard. They hate their children. But those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Another proverb, discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. If you don't do it while there's still hope, their lives are going to be ruined. I've seen it in teenagers. It didn't happen when they were younger, so their teenage years, they're bossing mom around, bossing dad around even. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. You think about how many people popped off at the wrong person because they had no discipline and ended up dead. Whether that be mess, you know, ended up in jail, ended up uh, getting shot in a club, ended up messing with police officers in a way they shouldn't, you know, having a police officer have to, you know, they, and I'm not, I'm not, this, I know it's a sensitive subject, but a lot of people, all this violence on, on, on young people that disrespect the police, it comes, starts with a disrespect of authority and and that's being pushed on people and i'm a little you know i'm empathetic in a sense that society is telling them every, telling young people that police hate them especially people of color minorities oh the police doesn't like you so they're coming with a chip on their shoulder and i get it but you know their discipline helps people that's why some people need to go to the military they really need it it helps them discipline but there's a mentality around that. Uh, let me let me say this real quick. When it comes to discipline, as a Christian, children need to know why what they're doing is wrong, not just because of the consequences. Well, if you if you do if you lie about this or if you cheat on your test, you won't ever really learn uh, the material, and it's going to hurt you later on. That's true. That's a consequence, but. There will be a time where they'll say, I think I'll be okay to cheat because I really need this grade right now and it's not really going to affect me. Or, or, And they'll start doing things like that based on consequences. You don't do it based on consequences. As a Christian leader, you tell your kids, I don't do it because the Bible says it's wrong. And they should know that. They should know that. Train In Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So the mentality that children will go out and sow their wild oats and there's nothing you can do to stop it, is actually completely against the Bible. Train up the child in the way they should go. And, and on top of that, the world we live in, you ain't got time to have a kid go out and sow wild oats. One laced uh, uh, drug that they thought was Percocet, but it had fentanyl in it, and they're done. One going hanging out with the wrong crowd and they go drive, driving drunk down the road and getting in an accident. They're done. The devil's out here playing for keeps. One uh, a bad friend that did a bad drug deal and then somebody's shooting and they're done. They're literally off the face of the earth. They're in eternity. Don't make that confession about your children. They don't have to go out and sow their wild oats. They don't have to go out and... And figure things out for themselves. And they would, you know, to some extent they do. But you have to train them up. You have to train them up. Let Don't let the training come from other people. At least give them the instruction. Do your part. Do your part as a leader. Number five, real leaders are a source of joy in the home. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The best way to be a strong person in your family is to be a source of joy. Don't walk in and now there's tension in the air. Everybody's walking on eggshells. We don't know what kind of mood mom's going to be in today. We don't know what kind of mood dad's going to be in today. Don't be that father or husband. Don't be that mother and wife. Find joy somewhere. Don't come give your family your leftovers and you gave your job everything you got. And you come home and you give them what's left. And, you, and then on top of that, you bring home the frustrations and the aggravations of the day and dump it on your husband or dump it on your wife or dump it on your kids. Don't do that. Just leave that at home. And when you walk in the door, you hit a second gear and you say, 
I'm going to spend some time with my child. I'm going to spend some time with my wife. I'm going to give them, maybe I can't give them quantity time, but I'll give them quality time. And I'll give them joy. And I'll give them love. And I'll give them what they need. Proverbs 127, 3 and 4 says this, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward for from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. So understand, children are a gift. And that's what helps me find that second gear. Sometimes I don't want to play Barbies. Actually, I never really want to play Barbies. I never really want to play dolls with Selah. It's not that much fun. But she needs it, and she needs a dad to do that. So you find the second gear, and you say, hey, I, you know what? I'm tired. I don't feel like doing it. But I have a reward from God sitting right there, my precious daughter, that I wasn't supposed to have in the first place. And she's right there. And that's how I find my second gear. And I don't know how you find it, but that's how I do it. And I come and I just intentionally spend time with her. I don't always, I, I said this yesterday, I'll say it again. I don't, I don't always uh, feel like hearing my wife's long stories. <laughs> she tells a story in pieces, uh, in every detail. And she was telling me yesterday, yeah, you know what? I, I like when people get to the point. I don't like long stories. But she'll, you know, uh, she has to run through the whole thing of how she got to the point, right? You can't just say, okay, this, this incident happened inside of Dollar General. No, I got to talk about how I drove across town to Dollar General and how I got out the car and, and this happened and that happened and then I did this and then that. Or I got to go back to the beginning of the whole conversation to remember this part that happened at the end. She's really good at that. She'll remember a whole conversation for sure. Anyways... But I love my wife, and I got I, I I focus in, and, and if that's how she tells stories, then I'm gonna sit there and 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 suffer through it to get to the point because she wants somebody to talk to. So you got to do that. You got to be a source of joy, as a father especially. Um, now, let me keep going. Number uh, number six, real leaders lose all insecurity. Don't be so insecure that you can't tell your children you love them. Don't be so prideful that, that you can't tell your wife you love her every single day. Don't be so insecure as a man that you can't hug and kiss and love on your, your, your kids and your wife. And, and they need to see that. The kids need to see you loving on your wife. Women, maybe you got past stuff you're carrying, uh, past experiences with parents, don't let that uh, uh, creep into, you know, your insecurities and your hurts from those past creep into your marriage and creep into your parenting, uh, where you're not uh, affectionate. Don't let that be. Don't let that happen. Um, the a coldness, you know, towards your family because of these these past hurts that can that can come upon you. Don't let that happen. Don't be that person that's, you know. Uh, they, that, that doesn't tell their kids they love them until they're on their deathbed. And then when they tell them, they're like, uh, you know, I heard that, uh, you, you know, your, your mother told me it, it hurt your feelings that I never said I love you. So I love you. You know, and, and people do, there's real people that do that. Now, maybe you've never done it to that extent, but it's crazy, right? Um, you got to be like God, the father who's all, who's feared, but also tender and compassionate. He, you know, you got to encourage, don't discourage, discourage. You got to appreciate, don't take for granted or they'll find somebody who will. Don't crush a, a child's spirit. Look for something good to encourage them. Don't crush your wife's spirit. Look at the positives. Yes, I understand she does some things that aggravate you. Yes, I understand your husband didn't take out the trash, but can we focus on one thing that's doing right? Can we start focusing on those? Or, 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 can we not focus on the one thing that's wrong and focus on the thousand things that are right? And and uh, that's that's what, we got to have a different tone when we come home as leaders in our household. Now, I want to go to uh, number seven so I can hurry up and wrap this thing up. Real leaders work hard and provide. It's a biblical responsibility. To provide for your family. This is not just something that the Republican Party or the GOP said you need to do. And that conservative values and capitalism say, uh, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. He shouldn't get any handouts. No, 
That's a Bible principle. That if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. And 1 Timothy 5.8 says, if you don't provide for your family, especially those in your own household, you've denied the true faith. You've, you've denied the faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers, worse than an infidel. You're on your way to hell if you're living that kind of lifestyle. If you ain't providing for your family, that's crazy, right? People don't talk about that. If you're worse than an unbeliever, the worst thing about being an unbeliever is you're going to hell. So if I'm worse than that, that's a quick way to send yourself to hell. Anyways, people don't like to talk about that. You're supposed to provide for your family. So figure out what's going on. Work focuses your mind. Work focuses your time. You sit around being lazy all the time. You get to work on something. Find your thing. Give it 100% because we're created to produce. Well, you were created to produce something with your life. The Bible says God will give you power to gain wealth. It didn't say God will grant you wealth like a genie. He'll give you power. He'll give you the ability to gain wealth. And what is that? How is that? Maybe that's your, your, your skill set, uh, um, a job opportunity, the power to gain wealth. Not just automatic. Not God is not writing you a million dollar check. God wants you to go out there and work. Number eight, real leaders eliminate divisive voices. If, you have a third, if you're married and there's a third voice in your home that's speaking into your family and causing division, it's a problem. Think about the Garden of Eden. Eve started talking to snakes <laughs> about a decision that was already made for their family. If, they were, if they're honoring God, the decision was made. We don't touch this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I'm sure Adam and Eve talked about it and agreed on that. But then here comes a snake, a third voice that convinces her otherwise and she partakes okay and bites the apple see that you know what's crazy apple uses that logo how crazy is that um we don't know if it's an actual apple though it could have been a different fruit but outside people especially talking to married people here uh outside people will cause division and maybe you're a single mother trying to raise somebody and you, you got to be careful who you let speak into your life there too, because you'll talk, you'll go to your friend who's not spiritually mature and they'll, they'll tell you to do things that aren't right. They'll tell you to light your baby daddy's house on fire and key his truck, you know, dig your keys into the side of his pretty little souped up four wheel drive, you know, but, um, outside people cause the vision. Some have good intentions. I'm just, they're coming in just offering their advice, offering their opinion. Op opinions are like butt cracks. Everybody has them and most of them stink. Some people have bad intentions. Some people come in and say, uh, they come in with the intention to cause division. The They'll soup it up with whatever, but they like to stir up drama and that's wrong. Some people have no life, so they just butt into yours. They need, they need to get involved in your life because they don't have nothing going on for themselves. I'm talking friends. I'm talking parents. Mom has no reason to be speaking in, uh, <laughs> into um, I was thinking about something. No, mom has no reason to be speaking into your life. Your in-laws have no reason to be influencing what kind of decision-making you're, you're going on. They can offer an opinion, but you have no reason to listen to them. You're only, have, have, you're only obligated to listen to God and, and your husband or your wife. That's it. You don't need to butt in. You don't, if you're an older person here, you don't need to be adding your input into your son or daughter's marriage. Matthew 19, 5 and 6, it says that th this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and they're united in one, and let no one split apart what God has joined together. They leave their father and mother. This, this pro broadcast is, um, is going a little extra long, but we're going to get there. Number nine, real leaders have a vision for the future. Real leaders have a vision for the future. 
Vision keeps people moving forward. If you can't see where you're going, you don't know what direction you're going. You don't have a target. You you just it, if you don't have a, a goal, you don't have a, a target. You're gonna run this way, that way. You'll go backwards. You'll sit still. You need a vision. That's why uh, it said it in um, was it Hosea? Write the vision, make it plain, so that they can run who read it. Your family should know the goal that y'all are going towards, whether it be some kind of career, whether it be uh, uh, an amount of money you're saving up, trying to do. Maybe there's a goal you have in buying a certain house. or I mean, there can be all kinds of goals. But what is your goal? And nothing wrong with that, guys. People criticize that. You know, uh, well, it ain't about the money. I just want to do what pleases God. Well, you can do what's pleasing God and still be blessed. Because he said, if you seek first his kingdom... And his righteousness, all these things that everybody else worries about. Because if you read that chapter, Matthew 6, a couple verses before, it's literally talking about physical things that people uh, stress over. Food, clothes, um, a roof over their head, stuff like that. And all those things will be added. So have a vision for these things. I, you know, Maybe you want an in-ground pool in your backyard. And y'all working towards that. Because, and, and look at it like this. She's not just, uh, if you're a uh, father and husband, she's not just the mother of your children. She's not just your wife. She's your business partner in this life to, to receive the blessing and fulfill the calling and purpose that God has on your life and your family's life. Y'all are working together. The Bible teaches forward advancement. And as a, especially as a father in the home and as a husband in the home, you set that for your family. And yes, you include your wife on, she has goals and she has aspirations and you let all that happen. But at the end of the day, don't let her be the only one having that. A lot of times I see that. I see people, um, you know, they're, they're, um, the wife has all the, the aspirations. The wife has all the goals and things she's shooting for, but the man has nothing. He's just going with the flow. It should be the other way around where the man sets a vision and everybody gets behind it and he's, he's, he's rallying everybody together. Now, wives are commanded to submit, but you need to give them as a man something worth submitting to. Give a clear vision. Your family should know what you're going towards. They know your standards. They know your goals. They know what, what, what you guys are striving to accomplish. So real leaders have a vision for the future. Vision keeps people moving forward. Number 10 is my last one. Real leaders le leave a legacy. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man, a righteous man, leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. A righteous man is going to leave an inheritance. And money is not the only inheritance you can leave, though it's important. And, and Ju the Jewish people have taken that scripture literally and said, I will, and I think we should take it literally. It, but they take it very seriously in, in the fact that they say, I've got to make, that's why they're so shrewd with money. And so, so um, maybe that's not the right word, shrewd. They're so money focused on like budgeting and, and producing money and buying properties and, and making money because they don't want to just leave an inheritance to their children, but also their grandchildren. So you got to have enough for two lifetime salaries, basically <laughs> two generations. And if you have multiple kids, it multiplies, right? So don't have your kids start where you started level up every generation. Financially, level up. If you started in a trailer, in a beaten, broken down trailer, let your kids should start in a house. Your kids should start in a, in, you know, in a decent part. You know, maybe you started in the slums. Now your kids, you brought yourself up to a level. Where they're gonna start in the decent part of town. They're gonna, they're gonna live nice. You should level up. You should hand them something. You should, you should give them that vision and 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 go after those things. Um, you shouldn't start, they shouldn't start where you started. Spiritually, especially, you need to level up. The things you struggle with, like I talked about, they need addressed. They need addressed. And, and, and your kids, there are things that my wife struck, 
family struggled with that, sh that my daughter will never have to deal with. There are things I overcame that my daughter will never have to deal with. And it should be like that every generation. It just takes one person that says, enough is enough. I'm tired of living this way. And when they understand that, they can crush the power of these generational curses or uh, cycles and patterns of behavior. They get passed down generation to generation. Learn behavior. You decide I'm not going to continue in that anymore. Because the same Bible that talks about generational curses also talks about generational blessings. A lot of people, they obsess over the curse. They don't want to know about the blessing. But everything that happened prior to you coming along and receiving Jesus and understanding who you are in Christ doesn't need to carry on to your, to the, your future or your future generations. Because the Bible says the curse of sin, that's the curse that sin brings, the generational curse that that brings is to the third and fourth generation. But the blessing is to a thousand generations. So when you decide, instead of it to, to, be, to choose the blessing over the curse, to choose life over death, to choose Jesus over Satan, to choose salvation over death and damnation to hell, everybody else gets to choose. And you, when you decide like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord in future generations. It destroys every yoke of bondage. Could be alcoholism, could be poverty, could be sickness, could be <clears throat> just sin and no no kind of righteous standard, adultery, lust, perversion. You get that worked out with God and you get that fixed and you get that settled and you decide I'm not living that way anymore. Your children won't have to deal with that. Their children won't have to deal with that because the blessing goes to a thousand generations. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday. Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written <coughs> in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So Jesus took upon himself the curse. So the curse has no power over you. A lot of people, they still live, they think they're under a curse. Once you receive Jesus and you realize that this truth here, you don't have to live in that curse anymore. You don't have to live in that anymore. This curse of sin is broken. Through Jesus Christ, God has blessed the Gentiles, that's us, with the same blessing he promised Abraham. And Romans 5, 17, for, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. We, people, the, many, we were all cursed with the curse of sin. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Not live in struggle with sin and death until you leave this earth and go to heaven. But to live in triumph. People, you're not going to live in a constant struggle once you realize who you are in Christ. Realize this truth here. It aggravates me to no end to see people who are still living in the same struggle because of sin, past sin. That's not who you are anymore. Jesus, don't take, don't, don't discount what Jesus did for you. A lot of people, their salvation is just, I don't want to go to hell. And that's their base level with Jesus. And they miss out on all the blessings. They miss out on all that. Because they just, they, get, they say, I want to get saved so I don't have to go to hell. And they'll live in the curse. And they'll live in the struggle. And they'll live in the patterns of behavior. And just say, I just want to know, but Jesus as my Savior so I don't go to hell. Is greater than that. You can have victory. You can have triumph. Even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness that we will cause you to live in triumph over sin. It's that all that junk stops with me. And the new life and the new creation and this new covenant with God starts with me and my family and it, it'll continue for thousands of generations. Every battle you had to fight growing up, every giant you had to kill, every victory you had and everything you had to overcome, even if it's been in your bloodline for, for hundreds of years, thousands even, your children will never have to face that in the name of Jesus. Believe that. Get your faith out there. Receive that today. I never did drugs. I never drank. I never had a problem with cursing because I never saw my family do it. 
I never saw my dad do it. I never saw my mom do it. And I know they were around some of those things. And I know they were in families that did some of those things. But because they decided I'm not going to pass that on to my, my son, I never had to deal with that. There's things in my wife's life. I'll let her share in detail, but she was from a very bad area in Brooklyn, New York, that, and she saw some rough things happen in her household. Uh, things that, without God, she would probably be dead or in jail, uh, living some kind of lifestyle uh, that would be terrible. But because of Jesus, she's been redeemed from that, and she doesn't live there anymore. She doesn't. Every negative thing left over from your family won't make it. Won't make every negative thing left over from your previous family won't make it to the end of this broadcast. If you get your faith there, I believe it. Choose the blessing over the curse today. You're gonna leave, leave great fruit, or you're gonna you're gonna leave fruit on this earth. Your kids and, and the things that you do, you're gonna leave a legacy as a leader. You're going you're gonna to produce great fruit and leave a positive mark on this earth because you're going to decide today, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's a true leader. You leave a legacy. People are going to say great things at your funeral. People are going to say great things now. They're going to give you your flowers now. You know, Joshua was not in a Christian land at the time, but he still made the statement, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. They were living amongst people worshiping all kinds of different gods and things. He said, let me be clear. And you decide that today. You say, let me be clear. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not saying I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to read my Bible. More. I'm going to try to get in church more. No, I am going to be sold out and committed to Jesus. I'm done with the sin. I'm done with the junk. I'm done with the addictions. And I'm moving forward in who I am in Christ. I'm not trying to be better. I'm going to be better in the name of Jesus. I'm going to choose the blessing over the curse. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Walking away. Make a clear statement today. I want to do this. If there's anybody that's watching today and you don't know Jesus, or maybe you, you've, been, you've been backslidden, you've been living a lifestyle that's um, not pleasing to God, whether you're watching this live or, or you're, you're, you're uh, watching it back, I want you to let me know if, you, if, if that's you and you want to make a decision for Jesus today, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe you're single and you say, I can't, I can't take my junk. If I want to get into a relationship, I want to get married and I want to have kids, I can't carry all this into uh, my future. I've got to deal with it now. Maybe you're struggling to lead your family as a father or as a mother and you need to make this commitment today, I want you to pray with me. And if you pray with me, I want you to uh, uh, let me know that you prayed with me. You can comment or you can send me a message. But let's pray real quick. If that's you, just repeat after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today in need of a Savior. I admit I've sinned. And I'm asking for your forgiveness. Today, I repent and I turn towards you. Forgive me of all my wickedness. Forgive me of all my sin. Wash me clean. I believe that you died and rose again for my salvation, for my freedom, for my healing, for my blessing, for my deliverance. So today, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power to walk in your ways. For the rest of my days, I will serve you. Today, June 17th, 2024, I give my life to Jesus Christ, and I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, I want you to send me a message and let me know. 
It's the best decision you've ever made. It's just the beginning of what God's going to do in your life. You're blessed because you've received Jesus today. Now, I want to I wanna say a couple things. If this blessed you today, um, we have a church in Sumter, South Carolina. If you want to give today um, to Dominion Church in Sumter, there's different ways to give here. Dollar sign Dominion Church Sumter. Or you can go to dominionchurches.com slash giving and you can sow a seed. If this blessed you today, no seed is too little, but sow something that means something. Put your faith out there if, if, if this blessed you today. Uh, it's always good if there's a word that really speaks to you. And maybe this was that today. Maybe you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. It's always good to sow a seed, a significant seed um, when God's speaking to you. And, and, and uh, a supernatural blessing is going to come on your life. I believe it. Now, I'm going to take a sip of this real quick. We'll do, I'm trying to do this broadcast every Monday. Um, so stay tuned. Let me know if you have other topics you want to hear. Um, and uh, thanks for tuning in. I've updated all the podcasts. I didn't update the one from last week because we were just watching videos, so I've updated all the audio podcasts. But I'm here at Dominion Church in Darlington right now. Thank you, Apostle Kyle, for letting me use this studio again. And um, it's pretty cool. We're going to deck it out. We're going to make it even nicer. He told me he needs me to help him with his podcast, so you'll be seeing a lot. So, um, But I appreciate you guys that watched today, and thank you for your, um, your time and... Um, let me know what you want to hear because we'll play something else in the future here. So God bless y'all. Have a great evening.